everyone. I am Professor Lisa Leslie, and I want to welcome you to today's Faculty Insights event. I am delighted to be hosting the Faculty Insights series this spring, along with my colleague, Professor Julian Yu. The theme for the Spring Faculty Insights series is current and future trends. Each week, we invite one to two faculty experts to talk about an important business trend, where it's been, and perhaps even give us some bold speculation about where it might be going. I am delighted to introduce today's faculty expert, Professor Melissa Schilling, who will be talking to us today about batteries, electrification, platforms, and data, how convergence in new technologies will change the world. Professor Schilling is a Herzog Family Professor of Management here at Stern. She has a PhD in Strategic Management from the University of Washington. Her research focuses on innovation and strategy in the high-tech industry. She's the author of the number one textbook in the world on innovation strategy. She also recently published a highly successful popular press book called Quirky on Breakthrough Innovators Who Have Changed the World. In terms of format, Professor Schilling is going to present for about 15 or 20 minutes. After that, I'll moderate 10 minutes of Q&A from the audience. So if you have a question while Professor Schilling is speaking, please, I encourage you to send that to me directly in the chat. Uh, select a few questions for Professor Schilling when she's finished. After that, we're going to provide some discussion questions, and we'll have a chance to talk about them and socialize with some of your peers in breakout rooms. I'll say a little more about that part of the session when we get to it. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Professor Schilling. We are absolutely delighted to have you here and are excited to hear what you have to say about the future of new technologies. So thank you so much for having me. This is really exciting. And it was really fun as your names were popping up really quickly on the screen. I saw a few familiar names there. Uh, so good to see you virtually again. Uh, okay, without further ado, I'm gonna pull up my uh, screen here. Okay, I'm gonna talk about batteries, electrification, platforms, and data. And we're gonna think about how the trajectories in these, in these uh, technologies are changing over time and what that means for the future. But to start, we're gonna start with a couple of fundamental principles just so that we're all on the same page about uh, patterns and innovation. Because one of the great things about studying innovation strategy is that you learn to understand the patterns underlying the phenomenon that are actually much more reliable than a lot of people think. So let's start with two basic. Okay, we're gonna start just with the S curves and performance. So technologies tend to improve in an S curve. And I have a video here, which doesn't seem to wanna move. Oh, shoot. Well, anyway, there should be dots populating this line coming up as we go. And what this means is that as you invest in a technology, whether that be man hours or dollars or, or whatever kind of effort measure you wanna use, it improves over the, that investment, but it does so in an S-shaped curve. And that happens because in the beginning, for down here, performance improvement is really slow and hard. You don't know what you're doing. It's relatively new. You don't have good suppliers. You may have weak enabling technologies. You make a lot of mistakes. You're still figuring it out, right? So and in the beginning, you're working really hard and you're failing a lot and, and, and your performance improvements are relatively slow relative to the amount you're investing. But then at some point, you might uh, start to get things sorted out. You might have adopted a dumb design. Everybody's kind of figured out what design of the technology we want. And the performance improvements start coming on much faster and they're much more efficiently with respect to your investment. Um, so for example, you, you might have better suppliers now. You might have stronger enabling technologies. You might have multiple producers all on the same learning curve pushing that technology forward. So you have much more steep improvement during this period here. And then at some point, very often, you start to reach the limits of the technology. It starts to flatten out. And that means it starts getting harder to improve the technology. You've picked all the low-hanging fruit, and now it's getting harder to figure out how to solve the problems that might remain. Okay, so we often see these S-shaped curves and, um, you know, something's going wrong with my, there we go. Uh, different technologies might be on different curves, different shaped curves that start and stop at different points in time. So one of the things, if you're a person who studies innovation strategy, one of the things you're going to do is you're going to try to plot out these curves. And sometimes the, the challenge is finding good measures, but you want to plot out these curves to see if one curve is steeper than the other, or if it has a higher maximum than the other. Because if it has a, a steeper or higher maximum than the other, you know that at some point you're likely to see a technological disruption. All right, so I hopefully you can see my cursor. Usually when I teach on Zoom, you can see my cursor. So at the point where these lines cross, now every dollar or, or unit of effort invested in the orange curve actually has a bigger payoff and improvement than in the blue curve. So if you're a new firm, you're probably gonna choose the orange curve. But if you're an existing firm, uh, you're already on the blue curve and you're gonna face some dilemma about whether to switch to the orange curve. 
Uh, so let me go to, to this slide. This is showing a series of curves. So we've got those first two curves we looked at. We've also got a new technology that comes in. And when it first comes in, it's initially lower performing than the existing technologies, but it's on a steep curve and eventually it's gonna end up much higher than these other curves. So if you're an incumbent firm and you're on either the blue or the orange curve, you're gonna face some conflicting incentives because you've already got assets invested in your technology. You might have union commitments, you might have supplier relationships and customer relationships. You have a lot of switching costs or depending on what you're doing, you, prob you probably have a lot of switching costs that are gonna make you stay on your curve beyond the point at which the gray curve is actually better. And this is one of the things that might give new entrants an advantage. So sometimes new entrants have an advantage um, when technology is changing rapidly because they don't face the switching costs. And so they're gonna adopt the, usually they're gonna try to adopt the, the curve that has the, the best payoff, the technology that has the, the highest long run potential. So this is the whole phenomenon, disruptive innovation. Now we're gonna talk about a different kind of curve and it's gonna look similar it's related to these curves, but it's fundamentally different. And we need to understand that it's fundamentally different so that we don't blur them up on our heads. This is the curve that's related to a consumer's payoff from different technology dimensions. So when we, I'm going to go back to this one. When we map a technology's performance here, we're kind of treating it as if the technology only has one dimension of performance we can measure. In reality, technologies have lots of dimensions of performance. Like if I'm looking at a car, for example, I could be measuring speed or power. I could be measuring fuel efficiency. I could be measuring economy, like how much car I get for my dollar. I could be measuring safety. So actually each technology is a composite of multiple dimensions. And each of those dimensions has a payoff for the consumer. And how much those dimensions pay off for the consumer is a function both of its sort of intrinsic utility in general, like how much do consumers care about safety? How much do they care about the environment? How much do they care about economy? And it also depends on how far we are up on that curve. So let's look at a couple of curves here just so that we understand this. If we think about music, like recorded music technology, if we go back to when it was first invented in the very late 1800s of the early phonographs, those very first records that were produced, actually the first things were foils of sheets of foil of tin, People were amazed. The quality of them wasn't great. The selection was really minimal, but it was something we had never had before. And as we started to get more units of albums like records available, songs available, the, um, the utility that to consumers was rising super fast. It became worth getting a phonograph machine for your home and then getting a record player for your home. It was super, super exciting. But today, now that we're up in the, the millions or the, you know, multiple millions of songs you could dial up at a moment's notice, the incremental utility payoff of an additional song is probably smaller than it was back here. In other words, we might be approaching satiation. Now we may never be fully satiated because we like to hear new music over time, but the payoff per unit, the payoff per song of additional song is significantly less than when we had fewer songs to choose from. So, so I'm modeling this as a parabolic utility curve. This middle one is even easier to understand. This is speed. All right, so the very first cars that were introduced uh, went about five miles per hour. The very first ones were steam engines and electric engi electric cars. So the very first cars were actually electric or steam. And the only, I mean, depending on what you want to call the first car, you can get into big arguments with car guys about that. Uh, but they only went about five miles per hour, which was significantly slower than a horse. And it was more expensive than a horse and less reliable than a horse and harder to use than a horse. So there were lots of reasons that people thought that's a stupid thing. It's not useful to me. It's just like a toy for, for technophiles who have money to burn. And then as the speed of the cars increased to about 15 miles per hour, people started to pay attention because now that's about the same speed as a horse. And as soon as the speed got above like 20 miles per hour, suddenly the utility of cars for each unit of speed was shooting up. Each unit was, was really valuable, at, at increasing the value of cars at this point, because now you're significantly faster than horses, right? So you can go farther and faster and, and uh, people give up their horse and they adopt cars. Then when you get to about, I'm gonna say 90 miles per hour is kind of where I, I ballparked it up here. You're starting to satiate your need for speed in our existing 
technology of cars. And we'll talk about, I'm going to talk about what changes that. But first, let's start with our existing cars. If you go out and look at your speedometer right now, maybe your speedometer shows that your car can get up to 125 miles per hour. Mine does something like 125 miles per hour, but I've never driven my car at 125 miles per hour. I've probably only once or twice driven it above 90 miles per hour. And that's because the speed limit, you know, throughout most of the US is, you know, between 55 and 70 miles per hour on the, even on the big highways. So, you know, it's, it's illegal to get, to go faster and it's also not so safe. And also the roads aren't so great. So if you hit a pothole at hundred miles per hour, that could be a really dangerous thing. So for most people, 90 miles, getting above 90 miles per hour, you're getting really small, if any, you marginal payoff for each of those incremental moves. Now that can change when we get autonomous cars, right? Because autonomous cars are going to have better reflexes than us. And they're going to have you know, a dozen eyes all the way around the car. They'll be able to parallel process all that information better than I can. And thus they'll be able to go faster safely if we make the roads better. And so we'll have to make the roads better. That's another thing we have to think about. The adoption of autonomous cars means we'll go faster, but we'll need better roads. So following that trajectory out, there's just an implication of understanding these trajectories. So we want to have two notions in our head that performance of a technology tends to improve in an S curve and that customer utility of a performance has some sort of curve. It could be parabolic, it could be S-shaped. In some instances, it could be linear. And we wanna know the shape of that curve and where we are on it. Once we understand those things, it helps give us a lot of insight. It gives us a lot of tools for taking apart other technologies. So let's talk about some technologies. Let's start with batteries. Okay, so there's a lot of different kinds of batteries. We've had a lot of improvement in batteries, but the truth of the matter is we're still pretty low on the battery utility payoff curve. Because if I ask most of you, how long do your batteries last? Are you satiated? Do your batteries last more than long enough for what you would expect? Are they more than light enough? Are they more than efficient enough? Are they small enough? No, the answer to all those questions is no. You know, batteries don't last long enough and they're too heavy. And there's a lot of things that are constrained in using battery power because batteries, despite all their improvement, uh, haven't we haven't satiated any of those curves yet. And we'll know when we've satiated all those curves because almost everything will be cordless. Who wants to be connected to a power cord connected to your house? You don't actually want that. You do that right now because you can't rely on batteries for very many things. So let's talk about the progress we've had so far. We've had a lot of progress, right? And here's mapping out some of the key renew rechargeable battery technologies that have happened. And right now we've, we've, we've gotten up to lithium ion, which looks pretty terrific on this chart until you see it, but until what you have to understand is we sort of matured lithium ion technology and we're still not to where we want, right? So if we think about the range on a car, right now, the, the, you know, the range on a, a Model 3 Tesla might be 220 miles. It's really not far enough. And you're not gonna go all the way to the edge of that battery because you're gonna be worried about whether or not you can get it charged. And that car costs more because the battery is significantly more expensive than an internal combustion engine. So there are a lot of things that tell us that there's a lot of room for improvement in batteries still. Well, the good news is there are some really cool new battery technologies being percolated and uh, being developed. I'm going to move. I have to move the pictures that I have of you here so I can see this. So what I want to show you is that this graph is log scale. Specific energy down here is gravimetric energy density. It means how much power per kilogram, or you could be thinking in pounds, but in the battery world, we usually use kilograms, but how much, how many watt hours per kilogram we can get into the battery, all right? Which it has to be really high if we're going to use batteries for things like electric vertical takeoff and landing devices, like a electric... Uh, drones for humans that can move humans around for air taxis, even for delivery. We need we need really lightweight, energy dense batteries. If we want to have battery operated aerospace, we need uh, really high density in terms of specific energy batteries. Um, OK, and then this is volumetric energy density, which means how much space the battery takes up. Uh, that's going to matter a lot for things like cargo vehicles or anything where space is constrained, like maybe your iPhone or your hearing aid. So uh, we're seeing this sort of diagonal line. But what you might notice is that actually we're making bigger improvements in gravimetric density than volumetric density. And what you want to notice here in particular is that lithium ion right now, if you look at like a Tesla, is about 250 watt hours per kilogram. And, and you know, that's considered pretty close to state-of-the-art in lithium ion. But when we move, we move up to lithium sulfur, 
they're actually we're actually looking at you know about 2600 watt hours per kilogram so that's 10 times the gravimetric density that's a big big deal that's going to help us do things like flight with batteries. And then lithium air has even higher theoretical energy density. And one thing that's also worth knowing is that none of these still get close to gasoline. Gasoline has an incredible, uh, is an incredibly energy dense product. So you can see here how far we've come and how far left we are to go. And right away, you know that, okay, so batteries are sort of the bottleneck in a bunch of different technologies, but these technologies are getting developed right now. So right now there's already prototypes for lithium silicon and lithium sulfur batteries. The lithium sulfur batteries have about double the energy density of lithium ion batteries. Companies are working on how to bring those to commercial scale. When they come to commercial scale, they're probably going to wipe out lithium ion batteries. Because the other great thing about lithium sulfur, in addition to being incredibly light and energy dense, it's incredibly cheap. So lithium sulfur batteries don't require any of those special metals like cobalt, nickel, and manganese. You, they're, they're, it, sulfur is an incredibly abundant product. It's a byproduct of the petroleum industry. So we actually have big piles of sulfur sitting around that we need to do something with. Um, it could be, could be a really great solution. So I'm going to argue we can expect huge changes to happen in batteries over the next 10 to 20 years. And that's going to have implications for lots of other products. Once you cut the cord for electricity, you can actually electrify a whole lot more things and you can do it better, faster, cheaper, which is gonna really facilitate this sort of everything connected model that you're hearing about. Internet of things, from your medical devices to satellites to your car, everything will be connected and it's gonna be generating lots and lots of data. All right, that electrification with batteries is also gonna facilitate some changes in the way we electrify things. So traditional power production was centralized and it had this huge environmental impact. It was dirty. It was reliant upon scarce resources like oil or coal or, or uranium. It just has a lot of bad things going for it. And once you have concentrated resources, you want, that also becomes a bargaining chip that creates political strife. It creates inequality. It creates conflict, right? As soon as you have somebody who can control power and other people don't have it, it's, it's just a source of power, a source of conflict, sorry. Um, batteries help you change all that. Batteries help you decentralize power production. You could have residential solar. We can have uh, tur wind turbines all over the place. And batteries help make these things possible by solving for intermittency, right? Batteries help you store the energy so that even when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing, you can store up that energy and use it later. So you've got decentralized energy production. You can use sources of energy that are clean and renewable. And suddenly you're reliant on uh, you're not reliant on scarce resources that are, have concentration of ownership. Instead, you're reliant on abundant, non-owned resources like the sun or the wind. So that's going to really change the way the world works. Okay, let's also go back here. Oh, I'm going to need my video. Okay, so the other thing you've seen is that as computers have enabled digitization, You've seen this rise of platform models of business. And this is, you're going to see how this all connects here in a minute. So in platform models of business, you have a platform mediating the relationship between some underlying technology and a bunch of users and, and third-party complements. Okay, so like the this is the Apple platform ecosystem. It's mediating the relationship between consumers and all these different apps all through a platform that's the iOS platform on the phone. And this is a different business model than a traditional vertical hierarchy or just buying and, and selling on the market. Now, this was has there have been platforms that have existed for a long time, but digitization really has enabled them to grow a tremendous amount in the last 10 to 20 years. And one of the things these platforms th have done is created lots and lots of data. Now, combine this mental model of, okay, platforms are growing, this platform business model where we're connecting all different complements, third-party complements, up with a whole bunch of users and we've got wireless power now that's connecting everything. Everything's collecting data. And you start to see that you could have this pretty major shift in the world where you're getting lots and lots of data, medical data, geographic data, transportation data, environmental data, financial data, consumer data. And, and we can envision this world where we have almost frictionless access to masses of data about everything you would want to do with it. And you're also developing at the same time algorithms for managing and utilizing and harvesting the data and creating value with it. So these, these changes are all connected. But now let's go back. Oh, and so one of the things this has done right now, because we're sort of at the beginning of that huge inflection point, is that the companies that have lots of data have lots of power. 
right? There's self-reinforcing returns to any technology with network externalities. There's self-reinforcing returns to data because as you learn to use it, you can uh, sell things better and you can know more about people. You can target advertising better. You already know all this, right? So the firm that has lots and lots of data has lots and lots of power right now, which has caused lots of worries about whether these tech giants are too powerful because they have these big treasure chests of data, all right? But then we have to remember, at some point, data itself will start to be uh, satiated. We will, we'll start to, it'll start to be commoditized. We'll start to hit some point where we're like, well, how much more is that additional unit of data worth to me? If I have data about a billion consumers from all different parts of the world, and I have data about all different aspects of their life and about five years of their purchasing decisions, how much more is an additional unit of data going to be worth to me? If I have data about everybody's health, uh, you know, for the last 20 years, how much, how much do I expect that to change over the next couple of years? I've seen how they change their diet. I've seen how they change their exercise. I've seen what effect it has on their health. It's not that data won't become unvaluable, but the marginal utility of each additional unit of data will start to diminish and it'll start to be commoditized. Lots of people will have access to data and we'll start to think of data as being kind of ordinary. And at that point, we might see the power of these firms that I showed you back here, the power of the firms might actually diminish. So uh, this is where I want to leave you. I'm going to ask you three questions about all of these, about these technology trajectories. The first one I want to ask you is what things in your life do you think will change when batteries are cheap, sustainable, and extremely long lasting? Look around your life right now and think about all the things that are plugged in somewhere. And then look at all the things that you would like to run better if they were electrified, but are currently manual. And imagine that all of those things had unlimited energy in them, untethered, cheap and efficient. How much will that change your world? It'll change it a lot. And it'd be cool to think about what things it'll change. Then I want to, if you want, you can ask a slightly harder question. What, how close do you think we are to achieving satiation in consumer data? So start to ask yourself about the different kinds of data streams we're collecting and how, where you think we are on those utility curves. Are we right at the beginning? Are we somewhere in that rapid increase? Are we getting close to the top? Or, or does data not have a utility curve that's diminishing at some point? And then if you want to ask a different kind of question, you could ask yourself how decent decentralized energy production, like solar panels on your roof, local wind firms, and frictionless energy trading are likely to affect things like inequality, poverty, and political conflict. So if I were you, I'd just pick one of those, and I would dig in and uh, have a conversation about it and hopefully get some traction and uh, I will leave it there. This is, if you want to reach out to me, my email address is here on the left. This is my Twitter handle if you want to send me a tweet. I also make a series of instructional videos that I post on YouTube, which are either, they're meant to be pretty easy to understand, short and fun. So you could check those out by just Googling my name. And thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoy thinking about these concepts. Thanks so much, Melissa. That was wonderful. Uh, thank you on behalf of all our, all our participants. Uh, we've gotten a few questions. Uh, so I'd love to just take a couple minutes and, and talk about some of those. Uh, so your presentation was really interesting in, in the context of our Faculty Insights event last week when Professor Adam Alter was here. Uh, he also talked about the future of technology, but his focus is more on um, you know, social media and sort of tech aspects of our lives and the impact on consumer well-being. And he made the case to us that all of this new technology and social media, you know, could be moving us towards a tech utopia, but also could be moving us toward a tech dystopia. And he actually came down on the side that we're actually closer to that dystopia right now than that utopia in terms of the impact on, on things like well-being among consumers. Um, so I was just curious what, what you think about that. Um, you know, overall, the presentation, I think, is much more an op optimistic tone of how these things can, can help and improve our lives. But do you also see any, you know, any downsides, unintended consequences? Um, are there things about these trends that maybe keep you up at night? Yeah, yeah. I think one of the big differences in whether someone's going to see something uh, pessimistically or optimistically has to do with how far out they look and how much faith they have in the world adapting and finding a new equilibrium, right? I tend to, I come from an economics background and I tend to believe eventually we'll find our equilibrium. Um, and I tend to look really far out. So sometimes I'm gonna see something a little differently from other people will. I think in the short term, so, so, so when you have a major technological change, you have frictions and you have switching costs and adaptation costs. And initially you, you don't know how 
uh, the world is going to look with this new technology and you don't know how it's going to fit into your life and the best way for it to fit into your life. So sometimes when we get these big changes, initially there's a lot of downsides and, and there's also a lot of inequality and we, you know, because things aren't being distributed equally and, um, yeah, and this is, you, you can get this dystopian effect. I think in the long run, uh, having more knowledge and more connectedness, we, if we don't want it, we won't use it. And if it values us, we will use it and we'll find ways to use it in ways that we like and appreciate and feel good. So that's why I tend to be optimistic. I'm just looking further out than Adam. You know, I do think that in the short run, you know, as a parent, I got a kid who's video gaming all day long and I've got a teenager who's on Instagram and I'm like, ah, I don't know how to deal with these things. And they're seeing things I don't want them to see. And sometimes they're feeling negative emotions or, you know, having strange signs of, it, of like game addiction, for example. Um, it's because it's a disequilibrium phenomenon, right? It, the same way television was, you know, when television was invented, people said, this is going to destroy our youth. This is going to be terrible. People will sit around in their living room watching all this garbage that will shape their minds in ways we don't like. And then we figured out how to kind of bend television to the will of our families. We imposed laws and rules. We created, uh, you know, differentiation and channels. We have parental supervision. So I think the same thing will happen in any social media technology. We're just not there yet. You know, we will we will we will eventually know how to manage these things or we'll get rid of them. You know, these things, it's 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 voluntary. The use of these technologies. Yeah, that's a, that's a great insight. I love that comparison of the short term versus the long term. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, another question that, that someone asked that I think is, you know, on everyone's mind these days has to do with COVID and the implications of, you know, this radical forced uh, innovation that we've all done. You could call it, yeah. I guess. I'm going to put an optimistic spin on it. And what, you know, either about the specific trends you talked about or other technologies you know, what do you see as being the sort of recent technological advances that are going to stick with us as we hopefully move back into a more uh, normal world over the summer and in the fall versus which ones you think are really going to going to stick and become much more of our, our daily lives? Yeah, cool, cool question. Um, so again, I probably won't be surprised you. I'm more optimistic about the outcomes of COVID than, than a lot of people. And, and part of the reason is that um, as human beings, sometimes we're reluctant to change and we're afraid of change because we perceive change as risk and we don't know where we're going to fit into that, into the new world once things have changed. And that can make us a little bit inert, right? And as a result, we, we can be sort of resistant. We tend to reinforce the things we already know and we tend to be reluctant to take on things we don't know because just like those S curves in technology, we could initially pay a performance penalty of moving on to a new performance curve, right? But what COVID has done is it's shaken up the world. Right. It forced us to try out some new technologies we weren't sure we were ready for. Most of us, most of the faculty I know who had to teach on Zoom weren't thinking, great, I was ready to start teaching on Zoom. Instead, no, we weren't feeling that way. We were like, holy shit, I have to teach on Zoom. You know, so it forced us onto this new uh, technology curve that actually opens up a lot of possibilities. So, so disruption has a way of breaking through inertia, which can actually help new innovations to, to rise to the surface quicker. And I think that what we've discovered is that we have a broader array of options for reaching people than we had considered. And now that we've been forced to do something we thought was scary, we're sort of past, I think most of us are past sort of the scary part. And I think in the future, we'll get to think about, okay, what's the optimal, optimal mix, mix of online learning, online presentations, online conferences versus in-person meetings, in-person classroom, in-person conferences. Uh, we aren't going to be forced to do online stuff. Again, it's kind of like social media, but now it's an option, which is going to help us reach more people more cheaply, which is actually going to be good for equality and, and things like that, right? Like I'm not, you know, sometimes I give a, a talk now and I'm talking to people in India or in, or in, you know, Abu Dhabi, hopefully some eventually in, in, in Africa. And you still have time shift problems because you have time zone problems of doing that, but you're reaching a much broader range of people than you would normally reach because a lot of those people couldn't pay to travel to your location. You know, they couldn't pay to come to the conference or they couldn't pay to come to your school, you know? So I really am, am uh, I'm very excited to see what we end up keeping, you know? And I also want to talk about online learning for a second, because I know it at NYU, we talked about online learning for the last 10, 15 years. We kind of knew it was coming, but we sort of were resistant. We thought, you know, that'll be for the, the that won't be for the top tier. That'll that's going to shake things up, and we're going to resist it. But um, sorry, my phone is ringing. Uh, 
And this forced us to, um, to like go full on online way sooner than we would have. And now we're realizing there are some programs that really belong online. There are certainly some Langone classes that'll probably stay online because it'll be so much more expedient for the people who take them. There, we definitely have enjoyed having some online conferences, online first side chats, because we can just reach so many more people. So um, COVID has sucked, but I do think we're going to get some big technological advantages out of it. It's going to just increase the range of, also, I wanna, can I mention one more thing? I know I'm taking way too much time. But for elementary school kids and, and middle school kids, you know, there were a lot of, for a lot of those kids, they need to be in person and they've lost out a lot. And so it's going to be great when we have in-person school back. But there were also kids who were underserved. There were kids who were neurodiverse or kids who had physical disabilities or kids who had different learning methods who were really, really struggling in the standardized curriculum that works well in person, right? Like our, our, our school curricula are designed to be um, economical to, to administer to a large number of people and to be uh, standardized so that everybody gets the same education. But that means that this, humans aren't standardized, right? The way people learn isn't standardized. So that means a lot of people weren't being really well served. And one of the things I see online being able to do is perhaps letting some of those kids get to schools that serve them better, that maybe aren't in their neighborhood, but maybe are taught by someone, you know, on the other side of the country, but taught in a way that is better for them, the timing, the rhythm, the content, whatever it is. So um, I'm excited. I'm excited about uh, having more options. Great. Uh, so we want to be sensitive to your time, but I have just one more question. I think it'd be a good one to, to end on from a student um, who is asking, you know, for students who are interested in, in these topics and more conversations like these, are, what else other resources would you recommend? Are there classes here at Stern or electives or your videos or what would be some, some uh, resources you'd suggest? Yeah, so I, you could definitely take my elective on uh, tech innovation strategy. Brett Prescott also teaches it in the spring. I think you must be teaching it right now. Actually, I'll be teaching it in the fall. Um, I mean, definitely take as many classes on on these kinds of topics while you're while you're at NYU. Uh, the Fubon Center also has a series of of online fireside chats we've been doing. So you know, check those out. They're free. You can just check. You can actually watch the recording of them afterwards too, if you if it doesn't fit with your schedule. Uh, I think the future of work program is probably going to also have some conferences like that that would have interesting, interesting sessions. Um, what else? I hadn't hadn't prepared for that question, but so I, otherwise I would have a list. But if you send me an email, I will prepare a better answer to that question and, and fire it out to you. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, so that wraps up our Q&A portion of the event. Uh, thanks so much again for such an interesting and provocative talk. So we're now going to transition into the group uh, discussion portion. Melissa's questions from the slides have already been shared uh, via the chat. Uh, in just a minute, everyone should have an opportunity to uh, open up the, the to join their breakout rooms and go on ahead and have some discussions. Um, otherwise, I hope everyone enjoyed our session today. Uh, we will be back uh, next week. We're we'll here from Professor Kathleen DeRose on the future of financial technology. Thanks oh, so much. I think, for she, thank you. I think she's going to talk about Robin Hood too. So that'll be fun. You should definitely oh, yeah. check that out. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you so much. much. Good to see you.